Sam, thanks for taking the time. Really, really appreciate it. Um, just to kick us off, do you, like like with everyone, do you want to just give us a quick background of your academic and like career progression? Maybe kick us off with like uh, why you picked A level, you picked, and then just go on from yeah. there. And I might just butt in, but that's just to get some more insight. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I I was really good at maths and sciences at school so that's kind of where I just kind of followed that down when I ended up doing maths physics chemistry at a level yeah. um and yeah ended up I did a physics degree at at Oxford yeah. I, I really I really enjoyed it um I'd never wanted to like stay in academia and and yeah. I found like the the more specialized I got in in doing science, the kind of like the less broad it it went. Mm -hmm, and I think yeah. that's sort of like probably what has suited me about asset management is it's a very broad role. Like you, mm. you um, I mean, you, you did a a very similar thing at Jeffries, right? It was yeah, like yeah, yeah. like look at loads of companies broadly, yeah. um, and you get to learn a huge amount. I kind of like ended up in it by accident. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, not, I, I applied for a load of internships when I was in my third year of university. So okay. a four year course for like the summer of, of right, right, year. Right, right. yeah. Um, and I, a lot of them were investment banking roles. There were some consultancy roles and mm -hmm. a couple of asset management ones mm -hmm. that were sort of like just thrown in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when I was doing the applications and when I was at the interview for the asset management role, mm. I bumped into a, an old friend who was a couple of years above me mm. and we got to talking and sort of he kind of pushed me. He he was a couple of years above me at uni mm. and had already got a job at Fidelity. So he was a right. first year grad at that point. Right, right, um, right. Really pushed me in, in that direction. Okay. And interesting helped a little bit with like actually understanding what the business was because I didn't have a clue like I didn't know <laughs> what the buy side was what asset management was what yeah, job yeah, I was yeah. applying for and I didn't understand any of the investment banking interviews or either. roles either it was sort of yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. why do you want to do this and I'd say I, I, I dread to read like what I actually wrote on some yeah. of the I mean it was sort of, I used to like go to like investment banking interviews and M&A and I'd read like a deal that happened recently and talk about that but it's so easy to know when someone doesn't yeah. know this stuff and they're just regurgitating nonsense um yeah. so, so so you started applying in summer internships but did you apply for like spring weeks and things or did you know about them or if not why not I I knew about them. I applied for a couple of them and I had an interview at RBS actually for a um a spring week to, week spring week internship. I'd mm. say at that point I had like even less of a sense. Like I, I think I came out of that and was like, oh, I need to do a little bit more over the summer to yeah, make yeah. sure I actually have a sense of it. And yeah. but I don't, I don't think I ever really knew when, where to start. Like I went to like e-financial careers. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah, know yeah. if that's still about, but yeah, yeah, I'd, yeah, go, yeah. yeah I'd go through that stuff. Um, I went to like a load of the sort of careers fairs and you'd, a lot of companies would come in and, and speak to undergrads and sort of pitch themselves, but yeah, yeah. not in a way that I ever really felt like they explained what they were doing. Like I wouldn't yeah, say... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think it's really hard. Like I, I think it's very hard from the outside to know what these companies actually do. Yeah, and even yeah, yeah. like from um, when you're already in in the industry, like it's very hard to work out like what other companies are doing and how they're yeah, all structured yeah, yeah, yeah. and what everyone does. So yeah, it's just I mean, all of it. Even 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 like I, I mean, it's only now, and it's kind of the reason why I started doing this stuff is because. When I was at university, I had no idea. And even I'd say up till about 25, 26, I had no idea what consulting companies do. Like, yeah. no idea. And it's only now, because like, I got into the MBA and half the class were doing consulting, I was like, ah, this is actually what McKinsey and these guys actually do. But I had no idea. Um, yeah. Okay, so so did physics at uni, 
didn't have too much idea of like career paths and stuff, kind of fell into asset management. Then you you start, so you're on the buy side and you start looking at house builders. Um, but now you're looking at US media. And I'm I'm interested in like what the journey is behind that. Because when I was on the buy side at Investec, like you had people like yourself, like who looked at house builders or looked at uh, consumer discretionary or whatever. And they kind of stay in that for a long time. But I think it's super cool, super interesting that you move from there to different sectors. Like, is that common at Fidelity or is that something that you so want? It's Fidelity, it's definitely like the the way the, the business is set up. So okay. the idea behind it probably comes from 15, 20 years ago when the asset management industry used to raise a lot of funds and they needed like... Mm there was like this sort of like churn you were like an analyst for like seven eight nine years and then you were a fund manager and, and the <laughs> business worked because there was always new assets and always new funds yeah yeah um yeah um and so the idea was you would rotate around sectors so that you could become a a generalist fund manager so <laughs> if you were going to run a right, right, right. uk broad fund it would help if you'd done a few years doing home yeah. builders and real estate, a few years doing chemicals, and then a few years doing media and telco. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a trend now towards more specialization. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So there's a lot of people that we've got far more people now who are long term analysts in like a specific mm. sector. Um, mm, 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 mm. Our autos analyst has been an autos analyst for six, seven years. Right. Yeah. Um, our oil analyst has been an oil analyst for 15 and our banks analyst has been a banks analyst for yeah, yeah. like at least 20. Um, but it makes, it makes more sense though. I, I, I thought as well, like if you're going to be a portfolio manager to know a little bit about each sector rather than being a specialist in financials, because sure, you'd know everything about financials, but then you'd have to really rely on your sector analysts for their input when you're making decisions as a PM. No? That's the, that's the, the job, right? Is, if you're yeah if you're running the broad the broad mandate mm. that's what you do we there are other firms though so like chatting to someone who uh today who worked at JP Morgan until um uh, relatively recently and they have sector sector specialists who mm. would know like media consumer mm. whatever whatever it is yeah. um and then they'd have portfolio managers who are essentially risk and asset allocation right right, so right, right. heavy specter sector specialism i'm really struggling with that today. <laughs> um plus like balancing out risk metrics is the fund management job rather than kind yeah, of the spot, yeah. stock specific um, yeah, yeah, analysis. yeah it's kind of like the sector analysts are kind of running their own mini fund and there's yeah the popular manager who's like waiting and asset allocation and stuff. Okay, interesting. Exactly. By the way, I th I think it's super encouraging for like a lot of students stuff who are who are who are listening to this and watching this because, like, for you, for you, I because I think I think there's there's a lot of pressure. I think there's a lot of competition these days on getting that spring week, that summer internship and stuff. And the amount of like prep and we're gonna come on to this later because the number of people who are asking me, you know. Should I be doing the IMC? Should I be doing the CFA at university? I'm like, that is so early to be doing all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But but it'll be good to get your thoughts later on that. Um, some just come down. Um, but um, okay, so a bit more about the actual role, Sam. So as an equity analyst, so this week we've been talking about Netflix. So the career talks uh, relates to that. If you were given Netflix to analyze, let's say as a graduate equity analyst, like where would you start? Like like what do you read? What do you spend your time researching? Because you can, they can end up <laughs> being this dark, dark hole you go down. There's so much to read about a company. So like, yeah, where do you start? I think I, I, I do the same thing. I was reading your like business breakdown of it and you do the same thing, right? You, I always try and work out how a company makes money. And that's mm -hmm. like, sounds like a really easy and obvious thing to do. But how does if you think of like a business as a box and it's just like money comes out of the box, it's sort of those mm. are the earnings. You get some earnings out of this box every year. Mm. Mm. How does that like, how does that happen? Mm. Um, and that's, it's, 
seems really simple, but those are the revenues and the sales that they make minus yeah. the, the costs they make. So work out what's going to drive the the costs, what's going to make, the, sorry, the revenues, what's going to make the revenues go higher. For Netflix, that's like adding the advertising tier. What's, mm -hmm. what's the additional revenue that they're going to generate from that? Yeah. Um, and then what are the, the costs going to be driven driven by and for yeah for netflix that the biggest part of that of the cost structure is the content mm, mm, um mm. and you've kind of got to have a for any company you need to work out what the two or three things that that matter yeah are. yeah yeah exactly you can't think you can't think about everything and you can't like work out the um if you're trying <laughs> to work out what the two things are that matter to the cost then what's going to drive the content spend yeah yeah um yeah. that's what's important yeah yeah so exactly it's those two or three drivers for top line and for costs which basically impact margins and that's going to drive profits but how how would you go about actually looking at those drivers is it looking to the annual reports looking at like quarterly releases listening to conference calls googling things like what how would you actually go about that doing that it's all of the above really like, yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah. not like I mean, uh, it's like pull, 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 so, so pulling pull the newsletter Netflix, Netflix is, an, is a different you pull up where where would I start for Netflix <laughs> so Netflix is an interesting one right because everyone comes in with preconceived ideas so you, yeah, yeah. You, you never start with Netflix you already kind of know how the company sort of makes money and you already sort of know that there. so like i don't think um you can talk about it more for like a a chemicals company so when i was covering them yeah. i'd have absolutely no idea where to start because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. anything about the business and it's impossible to work out what they actually make yeah um yeah. so there w what we can do that you can't do if you're like a um um someone at university or someone outside the industry is we can get a call with the investor relations and go through it in like a spend half an hour and be like what's going on here if yeah, you don't yeah, have yeah. that yeah then you've got to start on the annual reports and you yeah. experience you just get better at reading them right like yeah, you, definitely. It, it doesn't i don't go and take a 10k 110 pages and read yeah, yeah, every yeah. page um yeah. you go to the bits you're you need yeah. to and I mean, you, you go to the business model though. there's usually a section on business model or i actually go to like i usually yeah. go to the ipo prospectus and it actually gives you really good detail of like yeah. what the actual company yeah, yeah. Is. there's often a lot more in an ipo prospectus than there ever is yeah. again um, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Um, but I think, yeah. I think i think i think it's kind of what we're both saying is you need to think it, it's kind of like a, a a balance of like what's what are the drivers here and then reading topics but always making sure you relate you were reading to those drivers. Like I was chatting to someone uh, who kind of like uh, presented Netflix to me and they were talking all about like the streaming industry, how competitive it's getting. I'm like, absolutely, yeah, great. But you need to attach that to Netflix's sales or Netflix costs. You have to, you have to, you have to say, you have to relate it back. You can't just talk about the industry. Um, and okay, okay. So that's, that's interesting. That's the reading. That's kind of like the drivers. Then how much time do you focus then on valuation? Like how long do you spend on like the readings of the fundamentals and then on valuation and what kind of metrics? Because I mean, um, I would be interested to get your thoughts on this because like when I, when I was at uni and the masters and stuff, like people talked about DCFs and things. But then when I got into the industry, I remember the first talk I looked at, I did a DCF and no one batted an eyelid. <laughs> I was like, what was the point of all that learning? Um, and now I understand why, but what are your thoughts? Yeah um i i had exactly the same thing for <laughs> i think the first company i ever looked at and i was we were doing an internship and i built a dcf and it was firstly it was wrong in a million places and yeah, yeah, yeah. secondly our the person who was running it just said no one will ever will ever use this in the way yeah. that like in, in a way that's useful there's there's too yeah. many assumptions that go into it it's incredibly yeah. confusing yeah. Um, and I think like more importantly for the problem with DCS, if, if you would like, when you're going to pitch a stock to a PM coming mm. in and saying, 
this is my DCF uh, output, gives them absolutely no information. Whereas if you can say, this is where I think, really you're, what you're trying to work out is an investor, as an investor is how am I going to get paid on this stock, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So yeah. how we're, we're here at the moment, I want an outcome that's here in like three, four, five years. Yeah. What are the, what's going to happen to get us there? And that is effectively one way you can do that is saying, this is this is where the earnings are going to go to. Yeah. And this is how much we will pay for those earnings in yeah. three years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's really simple, like P times earnings. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's great to say that because that's exactly what I tell a lot of the students is work out what your the EPS is going to be in a couple of years, two three years. Work out, you know, maybe you can do like a bear baseball kind of like valuation, and then you've kind of got your like price range. But but then like. Something that I, I, which was very new to me when I joined asset management and joined the buy side was how important consensus estimates are. Because again, you see a lot of stock pitches and you're like, okay, great, but this might already be built into the stock price. And so you kind of look at consensus, what consensus is thinking EPS is going to be based on what they think top line and costs are going to do. And then you say, ah, this is where we differ. Because if you don't differ in terms of EPS and valuation, where is the upside? Like you said, how are you going to get paid for this? investment um yeah. but again like that isn't something you're taught a lot before you go into the industry yeah i think there's a there's a thing in academia of like talking about like a fair value for a stock yeah and <laughs> yeah the more, the more time i spend in like this this job the less i think that that really exists as a thing like take yeah. netflix as an example right yeah. netflix has been worth I'll get these numbers wrong. So mm. no one, no one fact check me on this, but somewhere <laughs> between a hundred billion and 300 billion valuation for the last, like in at mm. some points in the last yeah. 18 months, you yeah. try and tell me like what the fair value of that was. And it doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter yeah. um, because it, it doesn't sit at like fair value. Exactly. Like, I mean, all that matters, I, like more and more when, when I think about it is, what are consensus saying for the next couple of quarters? And if you beat on those, their earnings are going to get up upgraded and the stock will move in that kind of direction as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's interesting why, as you said, in academia, that is not talked about. Like in the yeah. CFAs, I don't think the word consensus came up once, which That's is really interesting, which is astonishing because yeah. that is teaching you to be an equity analyst. But yeah. No, the, the, the most important thing the only the only way to like to make money on a stock is that it's not the only way to make money on a stock you can buy stocks that everyone loves and they mm. do better the and you, you can have a view that is relatively consensus so yeah. that yeah. like people like this company and it's just a very good company and it will do well over time yeah yeah perfectly fine um but even that Sam, really that Sam, you could say you could say you might have a consensus view on eps but you think the sentiment is always going to be strong and so the valuation stays high over the next few years so i mean yeah. i saw that like where loads of well not loads but i remember there's a portfolio manager who just picked like small cap companies and this was back in like 2016 where things were still yeah. all going like that and i was like i mean <laughs> where's I mean, there's not loads of skill involved here. He's just picking like really like punchy valuation companies that just stay at that valuation. Yeah, I I, I don't mind that. I think if you can find so, if you can yeah. tell me why something's expensive but the valuation is going to hold for yeah. two three years and the earnings growth is going to be better than your your comparison is versus the the market, right? Yeah, if yeah, you, yeah. You yeah. can tell me why the earnings on this company is going to be better for two three years than mm. the market. And and the valuation will hold in. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a buy all day long. Like but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you are so like yeah. There's either there's two ways of doing it. I think is either you you get really good at getting acceleration and deceleration right. So like when fundamentals get better, yeah. Um, you'll often have like firstly the consensus numbers move up. So yeah. People's earnings estimates move up, so you get the earnings yeah. thing, and because this thing is getting better, the multiple yeah. goes up. So you get like this double whammy effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very hard to do, and you've got to be very good at getting those things right on like yeah. a every single quarter for US companies. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Versus 
in our seat versus a lot of um, hedge funds when that's all they do. Yes, well, yes. Um, the other way of doing it, I think, is to have um, longer term views on where things are going. Mm. And and yeah, get that kind of like, this is where the fundamentals are going mm. and play that kind of time arbitrage where the, the fact that your view, where you're taking a view on the kind of the longer term and everyone else mm. is more interested in that shorter term acceleration, deceleration, mm. and where you can find things that maybe have decelerated recently, but yeah. the longer term still looks good. Yeah, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. That's another way of, of going about it and, and getting that kind of longer term compounding and doing yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um I'll just I'll 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 move on a little bit, Sam. So like just to chat briefly about Netflix um and their strategy, because a few years ago, I mean I think Reed Hastings used to get asked a lot about ads and he was like, We'll never put them out there because of the customer experience. And I was surprised, but like now obviously these ad tiers are coming in. What do you think about this? Like the the move to go into ads, like is it because you know subscription growth isn't as strong? Like anyone who most people know about Netflix, if they're going to have Netflix, they would have got it by now. Obviously, we're in a cost of living crisis. Like that pricing lever, maybe not there as much, and you have to go into a new net revenue stream. Is it just smart, and it's what loads of companies like Amazon and stuff going into ads, or is it a bit of desperation? What are your thoughts? I think it's um, I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah. So I I think they would always have ended up doing advertising because mm -hmm. the the if you kind of take a step back, they created this business model, right? Them and yep. and and Hulu actually were out a very, very similar time. Um, mm -hmm. um 15, 16 years ago. Um mm -hmm. and when they started it, they you you had to prove out that like subscription was a good way of of um subscription on demand video would actually work no one knew that yeah. in, in 2007 yeah, um, yeah. they've pr they proved that 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 works and you can generate a huge amount of revenue doing that yeah, yeah um but it wasn't necessarily obvious that advertising would work on that platform like would you pay would you pay the same amount for something that also had advertising yeah, how much yeah, would you yeah. pay with less and hulu have been doing it for a while mm -hmm. um and you're doing Disney next week, so I'm sure you talk about Hulu. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, Hulu have been doing it for a while, and they found that their most, they get more revenue per subscriber for an advertising sub than they do for a, a premium yeah. sub, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think it just becomes like a, a, it's a no-brainer. Eventually, you can do the swap with the consumer, where you tell the consumer you're going to charge them three dollars less. Yeah, but you'll have to watch advertising. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, some and your average revenue to... per consumer then is is higher because you get the ads on top of that, no? Yeah, so like Netflix talk about it, and they're super early in this, and but they've taken in the US a three dollar price deduction mm. for um, um, the the ad tier for the basic with ads tier. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they've said there will be revenue positive. For them, so they're making yeah, yeah, yeah. at least three dollars back. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In advertising, so that's great. That 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 for me, that was always going to happen. If you can like get free or basically free extra revenue for the same yeah. product, then that was always going to happen. The timing of it, I think, it was definitely driven by coming to the end of the um, the end of the pandemic, have and suddenly not seeing the subscribers come off probably more uh, yeah faster than they were expecting faster yeah, than the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, analyst community was expecting and then that had a massive impact on on the share price yeah um yeah. and so they felt like now was the time and the, to be fair to them they set it off amazingly quickly it, to yeah, go yeah, in yeah, yeah. six months from we're thinking about an advertising service and obviously they've been talking about it before then yeah, yeah, you, yeah, can't yeah. Just, you can't just announce it uh, on a Thursday when like you realize <laughs> that the shit, that stuff is done. They'd yeah, done yeah. the work. They knew how this was going to work. But yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to get it from we're looking for it to the deal with Microsoft to yeah. having it launched by November, it's unbelievably quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I think the ad thing, ad, ad tier will be super interesting. But I think the 
the the password sharing i think that would be a really interesting one as well because i think i saw in spain it's something like an extra five pound to add it add to share it with someone outside your family which seems like a seems like a you know fair fair amount but um again it's like increasing your revenue per subscriber by doing all these things though um okay perfect sam i just want to get into some more like softer things now um but like a question I always ask everyone is, what do you enjoy and not so enjoy about your role? Now, everyone's probably reading this thinking, gosh, I'd love to be in his position, like PM, co-PM of, you know, of a fund, like looking at cool companies, asset management. So what you enjoy probably is fairly obvious for people, but like, what do you not so enjoy about the role as well? Um, what do I not enjoy? <laughs> the, the, the thing that's hard about, this job uh, it also makes it fun at times is your performance over um a short period of time mm. is incredibly like luck based yeah and if you kind of think of like if you have a solid repeatable process mm. um if you think that's driving like 10 percent of your performance in any year or yeah. maybe a little bit more 15 Yep. And then 85% of it is just random noise. Yeah. yeah and so yeah. you get to like the end of a year and people and people will judge you. Clients will judge you. Yeah. Management will judge you. Like everyone will be like, oh, you've done badly this year. Yeah. And, yeah, but yeah. You have to kind of stick to that, like doing that 15% right. And, yeah. and assume that over the course of three years, four years, five years, that kind of, the 10% becomes the signal and the yeah, 85% yeah, yeah. is still just, just noise. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. can be, that can be very frustrating. Mm. Um, and it can also, it can be a bit scary at times as well, because yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. Um, you're in this role and the, your career is um, internally, people know that you're doing good work, but yeah. externally, your, it's very your performance, based. performance yeah, yeah exactly. it's, what are your numbers how much money have you made for me as a client how yeah, much yeah, is yeah. that versus the the market or like the average of what people are making yeah, yeah. Um, and people are very short term like yeah, yeah they yeah. don't give you especially if you're trying to to raise a new fund or you've just been put on a fund people can be very short-term focused yeah, um, yeah, yeah and so it's yeah it's um no, that's, that's a, cool. and I think it's yeah, it's very no like amount of hard work doesn't doesn't solve for that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a lot of character, no? Like I I I I used to sit behind someone who, like every day, every every ten minutes, I think he would be looking at his Bloomberg screen, checking where he was doing, and I was like, "You're going to drive yourself mad." Like I was yeah. a grand, and I was telling him, like a few years older than me, I was like, you, "What? You, you, you? This is not good for your heart." Yeah, yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's terrible. It's, yeah. it's just. <laughs> Um, I think it's a bit like it's a bit like sport where the fact that you've had a bad result doesn't make you like a, a yeah. bad a bad sportsman. Um, yeah, yeah. You've got to stick to your process. It's much more yeah. post as you said, and then the result is the result, and you hope like over time, yeah, yeah. Um, and you also have to like when you're coming back and looking at like previous bits of work, you have to you have to be able to like unpick that as well. You have yeah, to be yeah, like, yeah. I got, this is the work I did. Yeah. Um, and I did this right or wrong. And it had this outcome. And you have to be able to like disaggregate yeah. what the outcome was from from the work as well. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pretty, it's hard to do. Like, yeah. Um, but, but yeah. And I like, okay. and also that whole side of it can be very, very fun when it's going right as well, because yeah, 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 like, yeah. you feel like a genius, right? You're like, oh, every okay. stock is going <laughs> up. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're of the world you've made your, you've made like your clients loads of money that like reflects really well on you everyone's yeah, 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 yeah. back it's it's a really nice feeling you kind of have yeah. to like not let that go to your head as well yeah exactly. um, i remember when i picked the, i think the first two stocks i picked were brilliant and i was like i am the king here but i, yeah. picked, I stopped went down 40 i was like i'm gonna get fired <laughs> like, it, it changes like that doesn't it what but, were they yeah. what were the what were the companies do you remember uh, the first one was Raytheon, US defense company, yeah. and it was when like Trump was like bumping up defense budget. So it's a fairly, fairly easy buy, I think. Um, and consensus for some reason was quite conservative. And then the one that went down was actually a Brazilian healthcare company, and there's quite a lot of like uh, 
quite a lot of like opaqueness and yeah, it was, probably wasn't the best. I, I, I mean, it was, it's too long to go into here, but I kind of like got the whole like, it's a similar time to now where they, it was like a healthcare operator and during a recessionary environment, there was a lot of people who traded down into like cheaper packages. And so the average revenue per subscriber was coming down. And, yeah. I, was like, and I didn't really see that. But as you say, like, if you really understand how a company makes money, which is why we're doing this and stuff, like you, I don't think I had a complete handle of that, to be honest. It's probably the yeah. fourth I looked at as a grad and I didn't really understand fully how the company made money. Um, so yeah. Okay, mate, something I wanted to ask as well is, um, well, we'll come, okay, well, I'll ask that now. Are there any kind of like courses you'd recommend to like aspiring equity, equity analysts or people who want to go into equity research? Um, I know you, from the sounds that you probably didn't do any, but like, is there anything you'd go back? Like, because people like obviously do the IMC, do the CFA want to say, get, get, get into the industry. Would you advise doing that at uni or no? I, so I've done, I've done the CFA, right? Like mm -hmm. I did it after, yeah. after uni. Um, level one probably helped. Level two and three, I think uh, maybe they'd be useful if I was changing jobs, but I, yeah. I don't think they're like, particularly um groundbreaking at yeah. level one i think is helpful but I, I i don't think you need it to apply for a grad yeah. role and i don't think we would look at yeah if we were looking through cvs mm. we are not picking people based on whether they've done level one of the cfa self-taught by themselves like that yeah yeah, yeah yeah i don't think we so see it as like a nice to have what would what would you what would impress you if someone is interested in SMG and they were applying, what would impress you? It's really hard actually. Like, cause there are, there is, we take about, depending on business needs, somewhere between like three to eight mm. um, grads mm. every, every year. Yeah. And you get thousands of applicants mm. for three to eight places. It's so hard to stand out. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. In, in, in that. Um, I, I do think like having a um a set like something that shows that you're that you understand the the space something that shows that you understand like what what it is we do mm. is really important so like mm. being able to say um why you like investing as opposed to like why you like companies like what what interests you about that um and, and then you, when, you, you, when you would you would you say would you say like for someone they should i mean when you're at uni is is it too early to for them to be saying i'm interested in autos and this is what i like about investing in auto companies or is it just pick pick what i think if it's genuine i think if that's a genuine yeah. thing that's yeah. really interesting it's, it's what it, interests you it needs to be yeah so like um I think like the most important, this job will suit you if you have a broad set of interests and you find mm. like how things work to be yeah, interesting. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. finding out about like how... Um, Mate, like I, for, if, for Disney, Disney, yeah. Disney next week, I found it incredible that I never, I never, if I'm being honest, completely realized how um, ESPN makes, I, I knew ESPN made money from advertising. I never knew about these affiliate fees. That they pay Comcast and all these guys, like it's wild how high ESPNs is versus yeah. Disney and stuff as well. If you can explain to me exactly how Disney works, then like, <laughs> you can swap jobs. There's so much going on there, but yeah, like it's all super interesting. Like some of the stuff that, um, when when companies blow up, you find out a lot as well. Yeah. Like when yeah. when a stock is going down, you're like, oh, I didn't understand how this part <laughs> of the business works. Or yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have like, yeah, people who are doing the nitty gritty on some of the defense companies, Raytheon, for example. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. they'll also do some of the rails companies where they're just like train companies in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super interesting, like weird little monopolies. Yeah, and yeah. Then, um, you have like, 
uh, but you don't pay much attention to it. And then like yeah. a few months ago, you had like a really sad um, derailment in mm. um, a place called East Palestine in Ohio. Mm. Um, and you're suddenly trying to work out how the US legal system works mm. and mm. how um, how big fines could be. And unless you like, unless you have a sense of like finding stuff like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort yeah. of interesting. It the yeah. job can be like it very dull. So I think yeah, the the thing you need to show to the, is it's curio- uh, curiosity. Curiosity, you know, yeah. Of how yeah, curiosity. Work. I'm I'm with and, you on that hundred yeah. in terms of with Raytheon. Like, I was so fascinated because like obviously their biggest customer is the U.S. government, and it's like like the U.S. government sets a defense budget and you need like bills to pass in the house versus senate i was like maybe i should learn a bit more about how the u.s legal system works and i actually did a course on edx about the u.s like legal system and found it so interesting but unless you know a little bit about the u.s legal system you're not going to know much about raytheon how raytheon makes money and then you're not going to have much money on the stock so yeah i think yeah i think it's super interesting just so instead of having all these like cfa level one and valuation courses it should be Having a bit of appetite, having an understanding of like the companies that you're interested in. Like if I was a grad, I would probably pick something like Nike or Adidas, like that yeah. companies that I liked and, yeah, and yeah. really understand, okay, how does Nike distribute their shoes? Like, is it is it like direct to consumer? Is it through Foot Locker? And really understanding how the company makes money, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would advise for like when because when you whenever you have these like grad applications for um for us for anyone else in investment management there's usually some sense of like in pitch a stock to us yeah. or uh tell us how a business model works one of the two questions yeah. um i would probably advise going slightly smaller than nike or adidas because mm. nike's all right it's, it's not it's not actually that complicated a business but it's still more complicated than say mm. a lululemon where yeah. it's and so just like a little bit smaller and yeah. then you can talk about the, um, and there'll often be like one or two drivers, but you'd be much better off pitching the two very big companies, but Netflix versus Disney, because Netflix is a yeah. far easier company to talk 100%. about, like how this works. Yeah. So may, yeah, the the advice I'd have for that question is find a company that like, you you really understand and yeah. that you like. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Now, I've seen some stop pitches of like, uh, some students giving me like, uh, is it KL, KLA Corp, the semiconductor company? And yeah. I'm like, I'm not sure I can judge on this because I don't yeah. know much about this myself. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah. I feel like and- it's a good idea for, um, for, uh, for us as well. Is like, don't don't put your money behind it unless unless you really understand what it does. And yeah, you yeah, yeah. so often fall into the trap of like getting caught up in like, uh, this sounds amazing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But when that happens you're always the weak hand when things start to go wrong mm. you're the person who's selling it at the wrong time at the bottom yeah. because you real that's when you realize i don't actually know yeah exactly i don't actually know what it is this company does it's what you're saying if you if you have a strong process you then have conviction in what you initially said and you can be like listen yeah. i i'm i have belief conviction that eps this is a this is a this is a decent level this valuation has stayed true over the years I don't yeah. think you can sell. Whereas if you don't have much idea on that EPS number, then you, you're you going to be yeah. selling wherever. But um, you also know when you're wrong, right, as well. Like yeah. if you know a company, like you need to know when you've got the thing wrong and you're like, you like, and that's when, that's when you need to sell it because yeah. things have changed. Like a, to, to the point of like splitting process and result, Yeah, you can do the process right and the result can be wrong because something has changed if you invested in um cruise companies going into covid Mm. nothing really could have told you that there was suddenly going to be a virus that meant that cruise companies were going to shut down those stocks were decimated your Mm. process wasn't wrong and it's a very extreme example yeah your process wasn't wrong yeah um but you still might you know the business as well yeah you know they're going to be closed down so you just you yeah, cut yeah, your yeah. losses, right? I mean, it's, it's, but it's it's an interesting one because we looked at Cineworld last week, and yeah. like the, the the pandemic gives people an easy way out because it's like ah, who who could tell there's a pandemic coming on the way? 
But if you yeah. really look at Cineworld, even before the pandemic, like people were shorting it and like the stock was coming down because the debt they took on was huge. Yeah, and, like, yeah. Even without a pandemic, the company's struggling. And so, you know, for an equity analyst, like you're saying, like they could just hang their hat on, you know, it's pandemic. That's what happened. But if you really looked at it, they could say, listen, I probably got that wrong because even with, with the top line being affected with cinema tickets and like, as we, we haven't yeah. talked about the, the shrinking like time window and stuff, like release window, like, yeah, it's a difficult sector. But anyway, um, Sam, I don't want to take more of your time. So let, let, we'll move on. Okay. Um, yeah. A couple more things, like soft skills, like, and in telling a younger Sam, apart from to actually understand what asset management and investment banks do, um, are there any kind of like books or like personal skills that you'd advise students who are reading this, maybe first, second, third year, even sixth formers to, yeah, just to help them in their development? Books, I think you've got to, you've got to read stuff that interests you. So like, mm. like read, read fiction, like don't mm. just like only read business books. Yeah. Um, the best book that I've ever read that was uh, business related is probably The Halo Effect. Um, I read that. It's good. It's really good. It's basically a book that criticizes other business books. And it's sort of like The Halo Effect is about is about management. But it's, it's The Halo Effect and sort of eight or nine other business delusions. And it's like The Halo Effect is we do this all the time at work. You see mm. a company and you see the management team and you say, this company is good because they have good management and this company is bad because they have bad management. Yeah, and yeah. really there's kind of like a horse and jockey thing going on where the if the jockey is the, the management team and the horse is the business, mm. then businesses will do well regardless of who's in charge and they'll do badly yeah. regardless of who's in charge. And so you kind of like associate this halo around this like right, right, right. Um, I've got but it taught the book itself talks through like lots of different sort of heuristics that people use to describe yeah. businesses sort of like uh fallacies that people can get into right, right, and it's right. almost like it'd be a good book to read before reading other business books you'll start noticing everyone does the same thing um <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah okay okay interesting That's and then that. any any kind of halo I'll, I'll have a look at that myself actually but any kind of personal skills that you think will help in your like for someone who wanted to get to your into into asset management your role because it's not obviously just crunching numbers and financial modeling there's plenty of personal skills involved in i think like there, there's very little like maths in, in what i do like yeah, yeah, yeah. very little at all um i think the thing that i had to learn and, and get much better at was um having conviction in my my view and sort of like having um being able to take a call because i could like i could speak for hours about like each side of the argument mm -hmm. i wasn't very good at sort of like picking one of them um <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. being like this is what i think's gonna happen yeah this is why and this is the outcome and sort of and then uh so like that's one it's hard it's hard to do the other one I say that's more of a skill that that people can work on. I still need to work on it and still get it wrong. It's just like when you're the job that the job that um the job I have is is not it's about getting the stocks right, but it's also about mm -hmm. getting other people to buy the stocks right. Yeah, and so yeah. you have yeah. to be just as good at convincing people that yeah. you're like that you know what you're talking about and that they're gonna make money from it as yep. you are uh, yep. like analyzing the the company and those like condensing something down so anyone can understand it yep. and you can give a good argument is is just and a, and make other people believe mm. what you're saying and believe in in your process yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. equally as important as <laughs> getting stocks right it's an interesting one because like, you know, you're talking about the different fallacies that we all have in business and stuff is that like, I think there was an analysis that we did when we were at Investec where the the analysts, sector analysts who were more confident and who came across like they knew more, you're more likely to buy it. The, the, you're more likely to actually buy their shares. But we actually realized, so so in terms of what you're talking about, it, it was a real skill. They had better presentation skills and like skills to convince people to buy it. But they also, that doesn't actually 
that's only half it, as you said. That's half. That's yeah. half of you're getting it in the portfolio. But that doesn't mean any at all that their analysis is better than the people who aren't better at presentation. But the ones who didn't convince them to get the stocks in, they then missed out because, like, they couldn't get the stock into the portfolio. Yeah, like marrying the two is is so important. Like that. That's yeah, what yeah. at the end of the day, that's what's going to make our clients money. Is yeah is me getting the work right and getting the call right but also making sure other people um other people actually buy the idea when yeah, i yeah, have yeah. it rather than like missing it yeah nice um sam last question um if not asset management if you weren't doing what you're doing what career would you think ah i could have pursued this after graduating from oxford um I think I think I'd have like I, I can tell you what I would have liked to have done if I'd have started all over again like I think yeah. I, and I think I didn't really think about it at the time but yeah. I could have uh, maybe done a real go of being a, an F1 engineer and that sounds really? ridiculous but like we have a um, a friend who does that and every time I I talk to her I'm like that sounds so cool like I'm so <laughs> jealous that you're in that um but yeah I never really um pursued it when I was at uni and I never like did all the stuff to do it I, I think in terms of like different careers that I could have done um I think there's a lot of like a lot more similarities in the skills and the um like the the skills and the ability to do different city jobs and there are differences mm. i think i could have enjoyed being a consultant i could have enjoyed doing um some of the investment banking stuff yeah um yeah, yeah. so yeah like i think i could have done done those okay but i don't think it's like yeah i think like getting passion would have been the f1 first. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, <laughs> nice, mate. I, I mean, I knew you and Dan were super keen on F1. I didn't realize that much, but I mean, he'd probably say a similar answer, I guess. <laughs> he thought about it as well, right? Like he yeah. was did like a project on it, and then yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. And he was much closer than I was, but um, yeah, like uh, nice. another life, maybe we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> nice, mate. Um, Sam, that has been. A pleasure chatting to you, like super, super interesting. I'm sure this will provide a lot of value for students uh, watching this. And um, yeah, really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, mate. Oh, mate. Glad, glad to help. Yeah.